succeeded. Good morning, everyone. Yes, Mr. Tigger, you have a new member as compared to the composition of yesterday. Why don't you introduce her for the record? Yes, Mr. President. As uh, foreshadowed yesterday, we are joined by uh, Katrina Gustafson. Thank you. Please continue. Thank you, Mr. President. I indicated yesterday I would be providing sites in um, closed session. Uh, those have already been provided to the defense, but if we could move into private session, um, I will provide them to the court at this moment. Yes, could, the, could we move to private session? Yes, Mr. Tigo, we are now in open session. Thank you, Mr. President. I believe I also indicated that I would be addressing a number of the questions posed uh, by the court in its um, uh, communication on Friday. I'd like to do that now very quickly, if I may. With respect to question five, that is, whether there was a reason why appropriation is not listed in footnote eight of paragraph 60I, the answer is no, and we clarify that uh, we do not allege criminal responsibility for appropriation or plunder uh, in the municipalities specified in that footnote. Thank you. With respect to question six, uh, the trial chamber asked how the prosecution reconciles the conflicting adjudicated facts and witness evidence in respect of the Mlakve football stadium in Vysonsky Novi. It is our position, Mr. President, that indeed there is no conflict. Uh, over 700 people were detained in the confines of the football stadium on the football pitch and its surrounds. One, so we have one prosecution ev witness who gave evidence that, quote, we were not physically mistreated or beaten. That was referred to by the court, P687, page 24. Uh, while another testified that he witnessed one beating, P3800, uh, P61. Uh, Your Honors, in, in circumstances where hundreds and hundreds of detainees are, are held uh, in a fairly large location in a variety of uh, of areas within that location, including some on the pitch, some under the grandstand, some in the locker rooms, for a month and a half. Um, th th these two witnesses' personal experiences cannot possibly speak uh, to the experiences of all detainees in the stadium, uh, and therefore does not uh, rebut the presumption of truth of the uh, adjudicated facts stating that there were beatings at the stadium, and that's particularly the case when uh, one of the witnesses himself gave evidence of a beating. Thank you. Uh, while we are on that issue, could you expand a bit further? Let's suppose the evidence in our case is the very evidence that the previous chamber relied on in reaching that adjudicated, establishing that adjudicated fact. And suppose they are not consistent or conflicting each other. What would you say in that case? Well, first of all, I, I'm, I have to, uh, I haven't uh, considered the, the prospect that the ch trial chamber is looking underneath the adjudicated facts to the strength of those facts, because we would be arguing those in, in various ways if that was the case. That's a separate matter. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, but, uh, uh, it's a hypo I'd, have, I'd have to see it in context, I must say, Mr. President. In, it's not presented by this circumstance, nor do I believe, I'm, I'm not aware of any circumstance uh, in, in our case uh, that, uh, in which that precise scenario arises. You've identified, for example, another uh, incident that is posed by question eight in Sokolats, um, where you raise, raise that a fact scenario in the context of a legal question. Um, and I was going to get to that, but I can get to that now because I am focusing on the uh, uh, specific issues related to adjudicated facts that the trial chamber has identified by way of noting that the hypothetical, what I think is the hypothetical the court posed is not presented here. In Sokolats, for example. Before going there, so the prosecution is against the idea of chamber going into the sources 
of the previous chamber's conclusion as, as far as the adjudicate fact or effect of it is concerned. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I'm for it or against it, Mr. President. In fact, in most of these situations where that has arisen, um, that's very much uh, to the advantage of the facts presented. For example, in the circumstance in the football stadium, um, we, I did look to see what was behind there, and in fact, you know, there, there is discussion by specific individuals of beatings in the stadium, including one person who lost an eye. But I haven't cited that because I didn't know that's what the, the, the chamber uh, would be doing. My, we have treated the facts as being uh, a presumption, um, and um, in, in uh, look to st our our initial focus has been on whether or not there is credible evidence in the context of the totality of the entire evidence uh, that would in any way rebut that presumption, and we have not not found it. Have not found it in the fact scenario posed by question six, nor as I'll s uh, identify in a moment in the fact scenario posed by uh, question eight relating to Sokolas. I'm, I'm, and I, m m by way, I mean, we, I'm, I'm happy to consider this further. One, one issue that uh, arises is um, it, it would be difficult for, I think, the trial chamber to, t even knowing uh, the, the, the facts of the case, it would be, uh, and, and the information cited in support, presumably that trial chamber was making its determination based on the totality of evidence as well. Um, so assessing um, how, uh, the individual cited pieces of uh, evidence were assessed and weighted uh, would be a, um, could could prove to be a difficult matter for uh, another chamber. Um, I, I alluded to question eight a couple of times, so let me uh, take care of that quickly. Um, that's 92 bis evidence for scheduled evidence 14.2, uh, um, and the question was in relation to. Uh, uncorroborated 92 bis evidence. Um, we would note in relation to the Sokolots incident um, that that is corroborated by a variety of evidence which we have listed in the scheduled incident chart and, and which includes the defense's own witness, uh, Dragomir Obradovich, who confirmed that the incident occurred. And for that, you can see D3175, paragraph 21. Um, as to the broader question of um, use of uncorroborated uh, Rule 92 bis uh, for the purpose of factual findings. Uh, Ms. Pack plans to deal with that in her submissions. Uh, question, if that's satisfactory, Mr. President, I'll move on to question seven. Scheduled incident 14.2, it's, it's our question. It's what schedule is it related to? Do you know the schedule number? C or? I imagine it's A, but I have to, I have to look it up. We'll, we'll check that and I'll get back to it uh, before I conclude. Um, it's A, you're it is A. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Your Honors, you asked in question seven uh, for our submissions in respect of uh, uh, Birch Code death certificates. So first, we acknowledge that there is no evidence linking the victim named in P4411 to incident B5.1. Um, but the victim named in P4412, uh, Mr. Akhmetovich, uh, Akhtovich, excuse me, was uh, among the victims buried in a mass grave in Bershko, which is listed in Avliash's 22 October report. At, uh, that's P1607 at page 14. Um, Rastanich uh, agreed that and, and testified that the victims in that report were non serb civilians uh, who were killed in Birchko, uh, including at Luka camp uh, and similar places. Um, and he also testified that, that's, that he told that to Avliash in a, quote, straightforward, unquote, manner. And that's at P. Uh, 3023 paragraph 220 through 223. Um, and it will be up to the trial chamber to determine um, the sufficiency of that link for its purposes, but, but that does, uh, that is the information related to uh, the victim in P4412. 
Just a second. I was told by Judge Latanzi that there's no French translation. And I'm hearing none. Now it seems resolved. Please continue, Mr. Tina. Um, Just a second before that. Whether the defense has, it, has any observation with regard to this question six, uh, seven, whether it does not oppose or the agrees with the linkage. Well, we'd have to look that up, Mr. President, uh, with respect to the second victim that he's just mentioned, but we could address that in our submissions. Thank you. And uh, finally, Mr. President, you, the Chamber asked in question 13 whether the prosecution has any submissions as to the possible mitigating effect of the uh, alleged Holbrook agreement on any possible sentence imposed on the accused. And in that respect, I would remind uh, the trial chamber of our submission on the 15th of January 2014 relating to the Holbrook Agreement, uh, in which the prosecution indicated that uh, while the accused voluntarily withdrawing from public life could in theory have a mitigating effect, albeit minimal in the circ circumstances uh, of the gravity of the charges of this case, uh, the fact that this withdrawal was purportedly conditioned upon a belief that he would obtain uh, a personal benefit, that is, the, the personal benefit of immunity from prosecution, completely undermines uh, any such potential mitigating effect. Uh, that concludes uh, uh, my submissions in response to the questions, Mr. President, uh, and Ms. Gustafson will be addressing the Chamber in a connection um, with um, the campaign um, of terror in Sarajevo. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Gustafson. Good morning, Your Honors, and thank you. From early 1992 to late 1995, the whole world watched as the civilian population of Sarajevo was fired on almost every day terrorized by a campaign of shelling and sniping, a campaign initiated and maintained by Karadzic and the forces under his command and control. The risks of being targeted by sniping or shelling transformed everyday decisions into ones that could mean life or death. In the words of one of Sarajevo's civilians, Sabina Shabanich, quote, it was a risk to walk. It was a risk to ride the tram. It was a risk to stay inside a building. No matter what, we had to take daily risks, end quote. That's P492, page 10. On the 23rd of November, 1994, Ms. Shabanich was shot while taking just such a risk, riding the tram home from work. And civilians dodging bullets became an iconic image of Sarajevo throughout the war. This footage from P928 captures civilians taking the life or death gamble of simply crossing the street. In Sarajevo, the crossroads can be lethal need to be taken at speed. They and the avenues that cut across the city offer the Serb gunners in the hills above with open lines of fire. Prime targets which the old and the infirm are forced to accept. And even when out of the line of sight of Serb snipers, civilians were at the mercy of Serb shellfire. A shell could fall anywhere at any time without warning. Such as this one, captured on film in P2005, which landed amongst civilians in the city's main shopping street in June 1992. 
round fell directly in the middle of the main shopping street. In spite of everything, people do go out in large numbers at this time of day. And the mortar claimed its victims at random among them. This is a perfect illustration of what KDZ-185 described as, quote, one or two shells which could land absolutely anywhere, the point being to maintain the feeling of terror, end quote. And that's P6060, paragraph 8. Nor were people safe in their own homes. Ziba Shubo described the modified air bomb attack G10 that destroyed her home and killed her cousin. Quote, Suddenly, my windows were dark, and I felt as though an eclipse had fallen. I lifted up my head, and things started falling over me. Bricks and plaster were falling all over me. It was caving in. I just felt the pain of things hitting me. While I was buried under that rubble, I heard the kids calling me and crying. I yelled to them to run away and get to safety. That's P488, pages 7 to 8. This was the attack that the main staff reported to Karadzic as a quote-unquote adequate response to quote enemy activity, end quote. That's P5943, page 5. And this image here of P1526 of the devastated Sarajevo State Hospital makes clear that there really was no safe place in Sarajevo. Ashita Fazlich recounted the debilitating injuries she suffered when a shell exploded on the third floor of this very hospital where she was staying. That's P470. And this attack happened on the night of the 28th to 29th of May, 1992, during the bombardment of the city that Mladic personally commanded and Karadzic supported. And the details of that are in our final brief at paragraph 727. Those who experienced the campaign explained that its message was clear. You are never safe, at no time, in no place. For example, KDZ 079, P480, paragraphs 21 to 22, Bell at P1996, paragraph 71, or Mole at P1426, paragraph 9. In other words, terror. And one witness after another, from experienced UN personnel to seasoned war journalists, concluded from observing the campaign day after day that its purpose was to spread terror among Sarajevo's civilian population. And I refer to paragraphs 608 and 784 of our brief. Karadzic oversaw this terror campaign, and together with others such as Mladic, Galic, and Dragomir Milosevic, used terror as a strategic tool to leverage negotiations, retaliate for events they perceived as unfavorable, intensify or ease political pressures, and punish the population. As Anthony Banbury explained, quote, Mladic and Karadzic absolutely had the ability to modulate that level of terror. They could improve conditions by, for example, opening the airport, allowing commercial supplies, supplying gas, stopping the sniping, stopping the shelling. Equally, make conditions worse by restricting these things. Both men demonstrated such abilities by using them as leverage in negotiations." End quote. That's P2451, paragraph 200. Witness after witness echoed this observation referred to paragraphs 608 and 609 of our brief. And many more details about the campaign are, of course, provided in our brief. And with that backdrop, I'd like to turn now to address some of the arguments the defense has raised in its brief. Uh, first, I'd like to respond to some of the defense arguments on the accused's responsibility for the crimes encompassed by the campaign. 
I'd like to then turn to defense arguments on the nature of the campaign itself and conclude by addressing some, some, some of the defense submissions in relation to the scheduled incidents. As RS President and Supreme Commander of its Armed Forces, Karadzic led the terror campaign for over three and a half years, all the while deflecting a steady stream of protests. His intent for the crimes of terror, murder, and unlawful attacks, and his liability as a JCE participant for these crimes flow from his central role in the campaign. And I refer to our submissions on these matters, for example, at paragraphs 614 to 652 and 797 of our brief. And today, as I mentioned, I'll focus on some of the arguments the defense raises with respect to Karadzic's role in the campaign and intent for the crimes. The defense argues against overwhelming contrary evidence that Karadzic was not even aware that there was a shelling and sniping campaign going on just down the road from his headquarters in Pali. We have described in our brief the flood of international protests that Karadzic received about the campaign. I refer to paragraphs 644 to 649 of our brief. And at paragraphs 2306 to 2314 of its brief, the defense appears to contend that these protests were uniformly so unreliable or erroneous that they did not actually inform Karadzic of any crimes or he could justifiably ignore them. However, the very evidence the defense relies upon to support this claim demonstrates the opposite. For instance, at paragraph 2307, the defense claims that, quote, various incidents demonstrate the inherent lack of international forces to adequately report on the situation as it was at the time, end quote. The defense refers to only two such claimed incidents. The first is the assertion that while Combe Doyle testified about the shelling of the TV building in April 92, he did not have any knowledge about where military units were deployed. And this, according to the defense, is a, quote, clear indication of the shortcomings of reporting procedures, end quote. Now, first of all, this mischaracterizes Doyle's testimony because at page 2721 of the transcript, <coughs> Doyle was simply asked which side a particular paramilitary group belonged to, and he answered that such determinations were not part of his role. He did not say he had no knowledge of where military units were deployed. But more importantly, the defense ignores the fact that Karadzic admitted to Doyle at the time that the Serb side had attacked the TV station and then claimed it had been done without his permission. That's P917, paragraph 77 to 78. So even if it had been true that Doyle did not know where military units were deployed at the time, this is irrelevant to the reliability of his protest to Karadzic. The only other alleged incident of unreliable reporting is evidence that General Wilson was unable to observe firing positions on a particular day in May 1992. Now on its face, this evidence does not point to any inherent flaws in international reporting. Moreover, Wilson actually visited Serb firing positions around Sarajevo. That's P1029, paragraph 49. And Wilson described the detailed procedures followed by UNMOS to ensure accurate the information was reported. That's P1029, paragraph 17 to 24. And as was the case with Doyle, Wilson explained that when he confronted Karadzic over the indiscriminate shelling of Sarajevo by Serb forces, shelling General Wilson had personally observed, Karadzic did not deny it. He claimed this conduct was justified. Quote, he would simply reply they were defending Serb territory. End quote. That's P1029, paragraph 122. So the defense's only two examples of alleged unreliable reporting by internationals in fact reveal two instances where at the very outset of the, 
of the conflict, Karadzic responded to international protests by acknowledging Serb responsibility. <coughs> this alone is a sufficient basis from which to entirely reject the defense argument that Karadzic was not adequately informed of crimes by internationals. As the examples in paragraphs 628 to 635 of our brief, of our brief demonstrate, Karadzic responded to the regular protests by internationals with a mix of acknowledgments coupled with false assurances or claimed justifications, as well as threats and denials, depending on the circumstances. The disingenuous nature of such responses is exemplified by his reaction to General Morillon on the 30th of May, 1992, when Morillon conveyed the Secretary General's appeal to stop the bombardment of Sarajevo. Karadzic initially blamed the bombardment on the overreaction of inexperienced and self-organized forces that were not all under Milic's command. Then he contradicted himself by affirming that he was in a position to stop the bombardment and would contact Milic in that regard. That's P1036, pages 1 to 2. The evidence that Karadzic had supported Milic's proposal to carry out this bombardment and that Milic Kindly slow down. 727 confirms that Karadzic's claim about inexperienced and self organized forces was knowingly false. In another effort to undermine the voluminous evidence of international protests to Karadzic, at paragraphs 2308 to 2313, the defense claims that international officials, quote, were either victims of the Muslim side's deception or were themselves party to the conflict, end quote. That's paragraph 2314 of the defense brief. As these claims rely on, the, on evidence from these very same international officials regarding Bosnian efforts to attract international sympathy, it is clear that these officials were in no way deceived. In any event, just, just a second. You remember having heard the request from the interpreters. Take a look at transcript page th 13 lines from 9. The, this ingenuous nature of such responses is exempl exemplified by his reaction to General Morillon when Morion conveyed the Secretary General's <coughs> appeal to stop the bombardment of Sarajevo. Then he contradicted himself by affirming that I think something is missing there. That he contradicted himself by affirming that he was in a position to stop the bombardment and would contact Mladic in that regard. Did you not say that it's a not professional reaction to, yes. uh, to the effect? And then the, the evidence that Karadzic had supported Mladic's proposal to carry out this bombardment and that, Ma and that Mladic personally commanded it. That's paragraph 727 of our brief. Very well. I'll leave it at that. Please continue, but please bear in mind that you should slow down. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. And the last line was, confirms that Karadzic's claim about inexperienced self-organized forces was knowingly false. Now, at paragraph 2313 of its brief, the defense cites General Rose's evidence for the proposition that, quote, the false picture presented by the Muslims was a contributing factor to an apparent lack of objectivity by Umpafor. End quote. General Rose did not say this. He confirmed only that this was the Bosnian Serb perspective. That's page 7290 of the transcript. The defense goes on to completely misrepresent General Rose's testimony by asserting that it supports the claim that, quote, Umpafor facilitated and took part in the smuggling of weapons or military equipment to the Bosnian Muslims, end quote. 
But as this slide shows, in the cited testimony, Rose categorically denied that very proposition. Quote, well, first, I would absolutely deny that the United Nations facilitated or indeed took part in the smuggling of any weapons or other military equipment to the other side, end quote. And what was Rose's actual position on UN objectivity? Testimony that doesn't find its way into the defense brief. Quote, we acted in an impartial and proper manner, and to suggest otherwise is to make the sacrifices of those people who died during the United Nations peacekeeping mission unworthy, and that is not the right thing to do, end quote. That's transcript page 7532. At paragraph 2312 of its brief, the defense cites Fraser, Thomas, Mole, and Wilson for the proposition that the ABIH fired from civilian areas in order to provoke an SRK response that could then be blamed on the Serbs. <coughs> These witnesses frankly acknowledged that this did occur and was protested by the UN. See, for example, Fraser at page 8075 of the transcript. However, these witnesses also described the indiscriminate Serb responses to such fire, responses that clearly reflect an intent to target civilians or civilian objects. Mole, for instance, characterized such responses as quote unquote pointless, quote, in extreme excess of what would be required to destroy the target, end quote with rounds falling in a manner indicating a limited focus on the actual source of fire, and with a time lapse such that there was little possibility of the opposing units still being in the same location. That's page 5892 to 5893. General Fraser recounted an occasion whereby the Serbs fired 20 plus rounds indiscriminately across the city in response to a few ABIH rounds targeting the Lukavica barracks. That's page 8007, 8006 to 8007. And Wilson watched the Serbs respond to two or three ABIH mortar rounds by firing 200 rounds across a large urban area, hitting and setting on fire apartment blocks a response he described as, quote, entirely disproportionate, end quote, and, quote, typical of what happened at the time, end quote. That's page 4132 to 4133. The defense has ignored this evidence, evidence that shows that international officials in Sarajevo were not deceived. They were not deceived by ABIH fire aimed at provoking an SRK response, nor were they deceived by the SRK's use of such incoming fire as a pretext to terrorize the civilian population with pointless shelling. In light of the stream of reports and protests provided directly to Karadzic, as well as to his subordinates throughout the campaign, and these are summarized at paragraphs 644 to 649 of our brief. Karadzic's claim at paragraphs 2962 to 2966 of his brief that he was not informed through the SRK or VRS chain of command of acts of terror or unlawful attacks does not assist him. To the contrary, the absence of such reports in the face of one, a sophisticated communication system, two, the overwhelming evidence that the SRK was shelling and sniping civilians on a virtually daily basis for 44 months, and three, the fact that Karadzic and his subordinates were regularly informed of this by international officials, shows that these attacks were treated as routine and accepted at every level of the command chain. <coughs> 
defense efforts at paragraphs 2962 to 2963 to argue that SRK communications were impaired to the point of quote unquote chaos rest on gross exaggerations and outright misstatements. For example, at paragraph 2963, the defense says that, quote, problems with the system of command and control persisted until the very end of the war, end quote. The defense cites two pieces of evidence. The first is D-2841, an SRK command warning about a failure to submit monthly reports on combat morale. In other words, an obsession with a minor reporting flaw indicating a generally well-functioning system. And the second is Dragomir Milosevic's testimony on that very document which confirms this. At page 32879, he stated, quote, I know that the system that was in place could ensure that we worked normally and any kind of intervention of this nature was simply an expression of the need to have it improved or to do away with shortcomings. Since I know how the entire situation ended, I believe that the system towards the end functioned meticulously." End quote. So here we have another instance of the defense evidence contradicting the very proposition for which it is cited. And as the evidence at paragraphs 676 to 697 of our brief confirms, the SRK enjoyed excellent command, control, and communications throughout the campaign. Karadzic used this system of command, control, and communications to directly control the intensity of the shelling and sniping campaign to further his strategic aims. For example, on the 7th of February, 1994, Karadzic issued this order, P3053, to the main staff, SRK commander, and SRK brigades. In the preamble, Karadzic explains that the circumstances are such that the very existence of the Serb state is under threat. That's point two of the preamble. As a result, he orders strict control over retaliation, that only military targets be engaged, and that out of control shelling be prevented. Karadzic issued this order in direct response to threatened NATO airstrikes following the Markale 1 massacre and the ensuing international outrage. And that's P826, page 2. Indeed, the very same day Karadzic issued this order, Akashi had firmly told him that unless he agreed to a ceasefire, the UN would have to bow to international pressure and agree to NATO airstrikes. That's Rose at P1638, paragraph 41. General Milovanovic immediately implemented Karadzic's order in P4493, issued the same day. Two days later, on the 9th of February, the same day NATO demanded that the Bosnian Serbs withdraw their heavy weapons or face NATO military action, the Bosnian Serb leadership agreed to a ceasefire to come into effect the next day, including an agreement to withdraw heavy weapons. That's P826, pages 2 and 4. As Kryzhnik said at the time, quote, we will do everything to avoid airstrikes, except capitulate, end quote. That's P827, page 6. And the ceasefire was also immediately implemented as evidenced by this 10th of February SRK order P1642. It explicitly implements the agreed ceasefire and orders all SRK units to cease fire at 12 o'clock 
on the 10th of February, 1994. And the effectiveness of this order was palpable. Seven days later, Ampafor reported, quote, Sarajevo is calm. The present ceasefire is by far the most effective ever made, end quote. And, quote, for the first time since the beginning of the war, Sarajevo is largely quiet and has been since NATO threatened to use airstrikes against heavy guns around the city, end quote. That's P827, pages 1 to 2. As these documents and events demonstrate, when Karadzic's back was against the wall, when Western military intervention was imminent, Karadzic didn't claim he couldn't control his rogue gunners or brush off protests with false promises or clean justifications. Nor was he stymied by poor roads, down telephone lines, or power cuts. He, the supreme commander, exercised his impressive command and control to immediately bring the terror campaign to a virtual, albeit temporary, halt. At paragraph 2982 of its brief, the defense relies on Karadzic's post Markale order to stop the shelling affirmatively. According to the defense, this order demonstrates that Karadzic ordered adherence to international law and the protection of civilians. To the contrary, this order and the evidence surrounding it shows that Karadzic could have stopped the terror campaign. He could have stopped the daily suffering of Sarajevo's civilian population. Instead, he toned it down temporarily to avoid airstrikes, thereby facilitating its continuation. And he continued to oversee the terror campaign for nearly two more years, including as it reached a crescendo in the spring and summer of 1995, when Serb forces intensified the shelling and sniping and launched a series of modified air bombs into the city in retaliation for ABIH offensives and NATO airstrikes. That's paragraph 741 to 754 of our brief. Other examples of Karadzic exerting direct control over the shelling and sniping relied on by the defense are likewise consistent with his modulation of the terror levels. For instance, at paragraph 2983, the defense claims that P4804, Karadzic's 11 August 1993 order to General Gverich, sorry, General Gvero and Colonel Persievich, that quote, no mine must go towards the town at any price, end quote, also shows Karadzic's efforts to adhere to international law and protect civilians. The defense ignores the fact that Karadzic's express rationale for this order was not to protect Sarajevo's civilians but to protect the Bosnian Serbs. As he told Guevara when he issued this order, shells falling on Sarajevo would be, quote, the greatest misfortune that could befall us now, end quote. That's in P4804. The defense also ignores P825, Galic's implementation of this order issued the same day. Galic expressly cites the threat of NATO air intervention and the ongoing political negotiations as the rationale for halting fire over Sarajevo. As we explained in our brief at paragraph 624, this is another example of Karadzic exerting direct operational control over the shelling of Sarajevo to ward off airstrikes. And in the same vein, Karadzic's order D4510, 
which is cited in paragraph 2971 of the defense brief, is linked to external pressure as evidenced by D172. So again, the very evidence relied on by the defense to argue that Karadzic was trying to protect the civilian population in fact demonstrates the opposite. It confirms the wealth of other evidence demonstrating that Karadzic and other members of the Bosnian Serb leadership ratcheted the terror both up and down to leverage negotiations punish the Bosnian side for ABIH military actions elsewhere or otherwise further their political aims. And I refer to our brief at paragraphs 609 and 620 to 627 in this regard. At paragraphs 2997 through 3000, the defense asserts that Karadzic took measures to investigate and punish crimes related to shelling and sniping. The defense's alleged quote unquote examples of SRK investigations into fire being opened on civilians cited in paragraph 2997 in fact reveal no such instances. None of the four cited documents mention any instance of firing on civilians. The defense relies in the same paragraph on Dragomir Milosevic's claim that he submitted 70 criminal reports while failing to note that he was unable to say if any of them related to firing on civilians in Sarajevo. That's transcript page 33212. And Karadzic's November 1994 assembly speech in P1403 relied on at paragraph 3000 of the defense brief, does not, as alleged by the defense, quote, demonstrate that he was doing everything in his power to prevent the illegal shelling of the city and have such incidents investigated. When the entirety of the speech, rather than the selection cited by the defense, is read, it is clear that Karadzic knew that drunk soldiers were quote unquote pointlessly firing shells into Sarajevo without quote aim and purpose end quote. And Karadzic was complaining th that this had caused him quote a hard time end quote and was a waste of expensive ammunition. Such a nonchalant attitude towards patently unlawful conduct is consistent with the fact that by the time Karadzic made this speech, he had allowed such conduct to persist almost continuously for two and a half years and would allow it to persist for another year more. Yet again, the evidence relied on by the defense undermines the very proposition for which it is cited. The defense's purported evidence of investigation and punishment simply underscores Karadzic, Mladic, and SRK commanders' manifest failure to investigate or punish SRK shelling and sniping of civilians and is a further reflection of their intent for this criminal campaign. At paragraphs 2984 through 2996 of its brief, the defense argues that Karadzic did not restrict, but rather enabled the flow of humanitarian aid and utilities to Sarajevo. Much of the cited evidence demonstrates Karadzic's control over the flow of humanitarian aid and utilities and is consistent with his modulation of that flow in support of the terror campaign. And while Karadzic claims at paragraph 2984 that, quote, several international witnesses, end quote, confirm his, quote, cooperative nature, end quote, in this context, the cited evidence contains absolutely 
no support for the proposition that Karadzic cooperated with anyone to enable the flow of aid or utilities. And of course, this is no surprise in light of the consistent observations of international officials that Karadzic and the Bosnian Serb leadership controlled the flow of utilities and humanitarian aid as another way of turning what David Harlan coined, quote, the spigot of terror, end quote. That's P820, paragraph 39. And I refer in this regard to paragraphs 622 and 777 through 782 of our brief. In short, Your Honors, the evidence the defense relies on in an effort to undermine Karadzic's criminal responsibility supports the opposite conclusion. Not only was Karadzic well aware that his subordinates were spreading terror among civilians by firing all manner of projectiles at them while depriving them of food, water, and fuel, he controlled and modulated that terror in accordance with his strategic aims. For month after terrible month, for over three and a half years, Sarajevo civilians were at his mercy, and he showed them none. I'd like to turn now to the defense arguments on the nature of the campaign. I earlier outlined the evidence of the persistent shelling and sniping of civilians that so many observers concluded was aimed at spreading terror amongst the population. According to the defense story of the campaign, this was not 44 months of terror caused by constant shelling and sniping of civilians. For 44 months, according to the defense, the SRK engaged in a precise, lawful campaign targeting purely military objects. This version of events relies almost exclusively on the claims of the very SRK officers alleged to have implemented this campaign, including in large measure the two corps commanders who have been convicted by this tribunal for just that. But aside from being an inherently self-serving account, aside from being thoroughly at odds with the consistent observations of those who lived through the campaign, including a parade of disinterested military observers, and aside from being contradicted by what the whole world could see on their television screens, the defense story collapses under the weight of its own internal contradictions. On its face, it is impossible to maintain. If your honors wish to break now, this would be a Thank you. moment. We'll have a break for 20 minutes and resume at 17 past 10. All rise. Feuille, feuille.